Cool. Okay, so this morning, uh, I, I guess, you know, this whole year, before I get to this morning's message, this whole year has had a theme of wholehearted and, and really being wholehearted about life, taking a hold of life. And I thought this morning I'd just ask the question, how are you going with that? Good? Because you realise the year's flying away, don't you? Yeah. We're in the fifth month. Yeah. The fifth month. So if you had some things that were maybe a little bit more important than just New Year's resolutions or whatever, if you had some commitments that you'd made to yourself thinking, I'm going to do better, I'm going to lift this, I'm going to start something, I'm going to stop something, I'm going to change something, whatever it might be, man, you need to be on the way with that because the year is starting to get moving. Uh, I'm not trying to depress anyone, just want to remind you that, uh, come on, who made some decisions at the beginning of the year? 2018, I'm going to take a hold of it, so I'm encouraging you to make sure you're getting after it, because the year's flying. In the first quarter uh, this year, I spoke a message at our all-in team night, which is where we gather all the teams in the church, and, uh, and uh, we worship, and we pray, and we, we have ministry, and I preached a message at one of those nights that... Even as I was preaching it, I thought, this is definitely a whole of church message. And then several team members came to me after that and said, look, we really think that the whole church should hear this. And so I want to preach a variation of that this morning, if that's okay. I'm going to revisit a thought from earlier in the year. And, um, and so if you're here on a team and you're at that all-in team night, uh, I'm hoping that this encourages you once again. Hopefully it's a little bit different. Um, and if you haven't heard it before, well then, this is for you. Turn to the person next to you and say, this is for you. For you. Cool. Um, you know, before I knew Jesus, I had begun to live in a world of pain, which when I look back now, I guess at my age, in my early 50s, uh, it seems incredible to think that uh, at 21 years of age, you could already create a life of pain for yourself. Like that 21-year-olds now, I meet 21-year-olds and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure they, they look younger every year. They really do. As you get older, everything looks younger. And so 21-year-olds look like 15-year-olds once did to me. And, uh, and to think that you could get in such a hole in life so quickly sort of astounds me. But that's where I was. Uh, you know, a few short years in the world making bad decisions brought a lot of pain to my life. And then I came to Jesus, and, and the fact is, it was easy to come to Jesus. Who, who, I reckon a lot of people here, if you came to, to Jesus later in life when you, it was a very conscious decision, I reckon probably the great bulk of us here that did that would have come through pain, come through pressure, come through, life is not working, I need something, and I'll give Jesus a go. <clears throat> and then amazingly, you discover that actually he can really help. He can really lift you. And, uh, and so I came to Jesus out of pain in a sense. But I tell you what, it, it didn't, I didn't escape pain. Maybe the pain changed, the kind of pain, the results of the pain. But you know what? In life, we are all going to face pain because we live in a broken world. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, welcome to a broken planet. It is life on a broken planet. And some of it doesn't really even have explanation. Who's worked that out? But that is just a, you know, a fact of the human life. But here's the difference between pain that I experienced, in a sense, in the world, and pain as a Christian. Pain in the world really didn't seem to have any purpose. A lot of it was suffering that I brought on myself, and it always seemed to end literally in death and, and entropy, or, or atrophy, where things just degenerated, just fell away and became less, and yet... Pain as a Christian, the, the tensions of the Christian life and following Jesus in a world that's headed the opposite direction. Whenever I make those choices, even though they may be painful, they bring life and light and increase and influence. And so there, there is pain to be had either side of the fence. It's your choice whether that pain leads down or that pain leads up. That's what I've sort of worked out about how the faith journey kind of goes. So when you're a, a believer, I guess you could look at pain in two very simple categories. One is letting go of stuff that you need to let go of, and, and I guess in a sense dying to self, dying to your own motives and will and desires. And, 
Who's found out it's, it's amazing that even the bad stuff that you know is destructive, you don't always want to let go of it. Like, how crazy is that? But as human beings, that's where we live, where we might even know this stuff is toxic, but, but we don't want to let it go. And so there's a certain pain in surrender. And then, then there's a pain that's like the positive, the upside, the, the moving forward pain, and I, I guess I'd call that the pain of faith, where you're actually making quality decisions to pursue God. And you might be, uh, you know taking the God option where it's like, well, I could do that and that's good, but, but this is really what God's got for me and there's a painful decision in that. Stepping into the realm of the unknown, stepping into the realm of trust where I've never been this, I've never been here before, but I'm determined to trust God with this. There's certain pain in that, but it always brings life. Come on, who's, who's worked that out? It always brings life and light. And this is what Paul says about that, I believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And he says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror. And what Paul's talking about there is, is the fact that in this flesh life, you know, this side of heaven, we only get a glimpse of Jesus. And uh, Paul talks about looking in a mirror. Well, old time mirrors were made of polished brass in Paul's day. So you didn't get the razor sharp image that you get nowadays from the mirror which you know I tend to think those mirrors would have suited me just fine even today you know but but you could just get a glimpse but just a glimpse was enough you come on you you think about this in your own life just a glimpse of Jesus a dull reflection is enough to move you onwards and upwards and he says you're beholding the glory of the Lord this way and are being transformed into the same image. You're being made like Jesus from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God. God is doing this layering thing where He's changing you and changing you and changing you. And through that process of change, there's often a process of pain. From stretching to generosity or service, sacrifice, learning to love the unlovable at times, compassion, just that word compassion, that's a big one. As a matter of fact, I wonder whether compassion is maybe the root of it all. Of all the pain <laughs> for the Christian. Because compassion means you can't look away any longer. Compassion pulls you past indifference. And compassion doesn't mean that you feel sorry for people. That's just pity. Compassion means you are compelled to be part of the solution. And so therefore it can often bring stretching and that kind of growth pains into our life. And this morning I want to speak to us about people who make Jesus thankful. In the light of what I've just said, people who make Jesus thankful. Because I want to encourage you with what is sometimes the pain of the unknown and we're not sure what's going on and, and we've got to trust God with where he's got us and where we're headed and I want to encourage you today. And, and the background of this scripture, we're about to go to Mark chapter 6 and uh, it's the feeding of the 5,000 which was preached last week by Dean. I think I've already preached it at least once this year. We just keep seem to be having messages come out of this particular passage of scripture and, uh, and the scene is, is that Jesus has been preaching. People have followed him. They followed him into the, the wilderness. They went out into a, a barren place where they could spread out. And obviously thousands of thousands of people could gather to see Jesus teach and, and minister to people. And the, the day gets towards the end. And, um, and the disciples have got like, we've got a simple solution. Just send them away. This isn't your issue, Jesus. This this isn't our issue. As far as I know, Jesus didn't sell tickets to an event that came with a meal ticket. You know what I mean? Like there, there was no lunch promised. And interestingly, we're, we're in Mark here, but Matthew says that Jesus actually said, I have compassion on the multitude. So, so we're going we're gonna to take on this burden. That's not necessarily ours. We're going to own it. And we're actually going to make a difference here today 
fellas. As I said, the root of our pain often is compassion. And so we pick up the story in Mark chapter 6, verse 38 through 34. And talking of Jesus, it says, But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they'd found out, and John's gospel, because this is the only miracle recorded in all four gospels, and so John has a different spin on it as well. Mark just says, well, they, just, they found some fish and some bread, but John actually lets you in on the, on the inside of the story and, and says they found a lad. There's a lad here who's got these things. And so in other words, that's, that's where we get the understanding of this was a little boy's lunch. All we've got is a little boy's lunch to meet this need. So they said, we've got five loaves and two fish. And then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. There's so many great stories that come out of this. So many great analogies, so many great sermons, etc. I mean, the, the overarching thought when I look at it, when you look at a little boy's lunch, it just never ceases to amaze me how Jesus can bring something significant out of what seems so insignificant. Like this little boy's lunch was so much less than what they actually needed. And yet in the hands of the master, what, what is insignificant all of a sudden becomes incredibly significant. And, uh, and often we don't think about our lives even that way. Like you look at that little boy's lunch, but in our lives, I, I see so many people that fail to see the incredible potential within themselves. We look down on ourselves. We often see, we're so good at seeing what's lacking. Yet Jesus is so good at seeing potential and bringing it out. So, you know, I look at that and I think, wow, Jesus can can do a lot with a little. He sees beneath the surface and he sees more than meets the eye and he doesn't just do it with these loaves. and He does it with our lives. And when I look at this story and I thought about this, I guess this is where my message come out of earlier this year, but we always seem to be preaching this from the third person. Whenever I've heard it taught, it's always sort of looking at the miracle, pulling it apart, pulling out all the different elements, pulling out so many great messages like, you know, the little boy. What's the message of the little boy? Just bring the little you have to Jesus. Yeah. And we've probably all learnt that. Yeah. We've probably all learnt that on some level in our faith journey. Just bring the little you've got. Don't worry about it being insignificant. But in the hands of the master, it can be so much more. So take the step of faith and give Jesus what you have. And that is a great message. That's a, that's a great point. You, you look at Jesus there, and again, as I've already said, Jesus can do so much with so little. We really just need to have faith that if we put stuff in the hands of Jesus, he can do amazing things. He can do the miraculous. We look at the disciples. And, uh, and I guess what the story is there is just do what you're told. You know, Jesus said, bring it here to me. Go find out what we've got. Bring it here to me. Get them to sit down. As the disciples did what they were told, just obeyed, probably thinking the whole time, this guy's crazy. We're going to have a, a massively disappointed crowd of thousands if we're not careful here. But as they did what they were told, they became part of a miracle. And some of us have experienced that. Just do what you're told. You'll become part of the miracle. And they are all fantastic applications. You'll notice that the, the one thing in common through it all is the crowd just sits there and receives. That's the one thing in common. You, you could sort of never preach it any differently. The crowd just receives. But I wonder what it would be like if we took a different perspective, if we went from third person to first person and instead of looking from the outside in like we're spectating a miracle, if we could actually move right into the miracle, into the center of it, and view what Jesus did 
from the inside out. And, and, and I think the only way we could get there is actually to put yourself in the mind's eye of a loaf of bread or a piece of fish. That's what was at the centre of the miracle, wasn't it? Yeah. So, um, you know, Mr. Loaf and Mrs. Fish, or if you would prefer, Mrs. Fish and Miss, Miss, I mean, Mrs. Loaf and Mr. Fish. If you could put yourself in that mind's eye, what's it like to be on the inside of the miracle? What did the loaves and fishes experience? Well, the first thing they experienced was the master's hand coming upon them. But unlike other human hands that had handled them, I've got no doubt that when Christ took them, there was a sense of of purpose and intentionality beyond what they had ever experienced before. Even for the loaf of bread. The loaf of bread that had already been kneaded by human hands and rolled up and put on a tray and stuck in an oven and there'd been intentionality in in all of that process of baking, but now hands come upon it, not just for what it's going to do to the bread, but what it's going to do through the bread. There's a shift. And the fish, if you... The fish is the messy application. Let's just be honest with that. But suddenly, as a loaf of bread, pressure comes... And the loaf of bread feels itself breaking. In places it feels like it's being torn apart, literally. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) Torn apart. And I'm sure that loaf of bread, if bread's had brains, would have been thinking, what's happening to me? This This is painful. This is uncomfortable. I'm being torn apart. Where's my comfortable basket? But then the loaf sees the purpose. I'm here to meet a need. I'm I'm here to feed hungry people. And the loaf of bread realizes this is actually the purpose. This is why I was baked. This is what I was created for. To be broken, to be given away, to meet need. Just another day in the life of a loaf of bread. But of course, the question that we've got to ask, and and I think what the story demands, and and this story is not a, a parable. Jesus wasn't giving an analogy. This, lit- this literally happened, physically happened. And yet the application, I think, is so much deeper. We've got to ask ourselves the question, whenever you talk about something in the hands of Jesus, you've got to ask, what if that's me? What if I'm the loaf of bread? What if I'm the fish? Mr. Fish, Mrs. Bread. What if that is actually me? What if you're the one being broken to feed others? What if the pain that you feel is simply Jesus breaking little pieces off you to meet the needs of others? And and we've all felt that pain as as God's people at times where you've, you've wanted to go your own way, but you've decided I'll go Jesus' way. And there is a pain and there is a tearing, but life always comes from it. Whenever he calls us to lay ourselves down. And I I think about, I don't have to think far to go through great analogies of that, of how that works, even on a morning like this morning. I mean, so many people contribute to make church happen across three services on a Sunday. And, you know, sometimes 750, 780 people in church. Thanks, Andrew. Andrew. On a Sunday, that takes people who are willing to allow themselves to be broken on a certain level. I think of our, our service crew and our musicians, and they're here before anyone else. And most of the time, they're leaving after everyone else. And yet they come and they serve in obscurity at times. They even wear black t-shirts to hide in the dark, some of them. 
but they come and they give so much of themselves and they surrender their gifts and they surrender their time and they surrender their talents so that others can be fed. I think about our kids' workers and maybe youth workers and life group leaders who actually make the commitment that when others might be spending time doing their thing, I'm going to be doing God's thing. I'm going to spend time preparing. I'm going over lessons in obscurity. No one will ever see. No one will ever maybe thank. No one will ever understand the commitment that it takes. But that's what I will do. Because I've sensed the purpose. I've realized what I was not only created for to glorify God, but now recreated, reborn in his image so that my life could make a difference in the lives of others. Um, you know, this year, so far in the first quarter of this year, we've, we've met a lot of pastoral needs in the life of the church. And just one of the things that, that has happened on, a, on the highest level, and, and hopefully, I hope some people are here this morning that were involved in this, but food trains that have gone out to families that have really found themselves in a tough and a hard place. And we've had all kinds of things. People who've, uh, who've been really, really sick, some to the point of hospitalisation. And, and of course, when new babies are born and they bring that pressure into the home, and yet we've got an incredible support network of young families. And, but people who've just been involved in making meals and after you know nearly 30 years of making meals for ourselves, we know what that's like, where it's like, you know, you get the meal on the table for yourself and then you make another one for someone else. And then you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And yet I think that's when we're putting ourselves in the hands of God. And and I want to go back to the title of the message, the kind of people. This is the people that Jesus gives thanks for. When he took that loaf of bread, he looked up to heaven and he blessed it. And he blessed God for it. And I think Jesus gives thanks for people who are prepared to recognise that they've been created for a purpose that's way beyond just fulfilling our own dreams, desires, goals, but we've actually been created to meet a need in others. I think of the young person who, and, and we've got a number of young people in here, I don't want to embarrass any of them, but the young person who just chooses to be accepting of someone that the crowd doesn't think is cool. To forfeit maybe some of your own cred to make sure someone else is included. You're a champion. Because that comes with a cost. But Jesus sees that. And he gives thanks for you. That you would be inclusive. That you would open up your world. Open up your heart so that someone else could be included. These are just some of the many, many ways that God wants to take a hold of our lives and begin to break. And there is a breaking in it, isn't there? Any of us who've ever put ourselves in that position, you know there's a breaking in it. There's a a, like a death to self-will and a coming alive to what God could do through me. Jesus gives thanks for you. And, And you know, when I think about our walk with God, we often think about Jesus' love and his concern for us. And uh, uh, well, I hope we do. Come on, whenever we look to heaven, we're probably thinking, Lord, I thank you that you love me, that you've got concern for me. And even when we're questioning, God, where are you in this situation? As I said earlier, if you hang out long enough, you'll find the goodness of God in it somewhere. He loves us. He is concerned for us. He cares for us. And and we really appreciate that, I think, because we know better than anyone how high maintenance we can be. Don't we? We know that we're not always the easiest person to work with, if we're going to be honest, and we appreciate God's love towards us. But have you ever thought about the fact that, that when you actually give yourself away for others, you allow Jesus to give your life away, 
he not only cares for you, he not only loves you, he not only there to, to bring healing and life, but he actually is thankful yeah. for you. Yeah. It's a two-way thing. It only makes sense. Because in any relationship, thankfulness and gratefulness for, for the other person, it's got to be a two-way street, hasn't it? Yeah. But I know until I sort of looked at this passage this way, I'd never really thought about Jesus giving thanks for me. That was probably the kind of thing that I'd go, oh, gee, no, I don't, I don't want that anywhere near me. Like that's, you know, I'm beneath that. It's like, no, no, you're not. He took that loaf of bread and he blessed it. You want blessing to flow in your life, allow yourself to be that loaf of bread in the master's hand. And we talk about being like Jesus, don't we? I hope we do. In our own mind's eye, don't we think, I'd like to be a little bit more like Jesus? Isn't that, the, isn't that really the standard thing? I want to be more like Jesus. Like, remember back in the 90s, the goofy armbands with WWJD? What would Jesus do? I actually think that's some of the best theology ever, ever produced and ever distilled down into like four words. I I think it's brilliant. And and we ask ourselves, how could I be more like Jesus? What would Jesus do? Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. It says, as they were eating, and this is the last supper, we celebrated communion just before. And in that original enactment of the meal, Jesus took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So when we look at the miracle of the fish and bread, I wonder if Jesus even foresaw that even as he broke that fish and bread, his own body would be broken the same way and distributed for us. This is literally what Jesus did for us. He allowed his life to be taken and distributed for humanity. And that's what he asks us to do. This is one of the things I love about Jesus. that He doesn't ever ask us to go somewhere he hasn't gone. He doesn't ever ask us to do something that he hasn't done on another whole level. And he leads the way and then he says, follow me. Paul recognized it. The Apostle Paul in his own life personally, Philippians chapter 2, verse 17, and he says this, and yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm glad and, and rejoice with you all. So Paul was like, man, if my life is being taken and distributed for many, it's a good thing. Yeah. I see it as an awesome thing. Paul could see it in his life. He's just following his master's footsteps. And it's our purpose too. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, again Paul, and he says, For we, though many, are one bread. That's how Paul describes us, one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. As we've experienced Jesus, the question demands or the, or the question that, dem- that comes to us is, now that my life has been changed, what, how does that make me act? How does that make me live? And Paul is saying, you know what, you've, you've come and you've partaken of Christ, you've entered into this Christian experience, this Christian life, and now you have become a loaf of bread. Even though there are many, you've become one loaf. And I'd suggest that, that there's one purpose in that loaf. And that's that Jesus could take a hold of us. His purpose could come upon us. And that our lives could make a difference in the lives of so many around us. And, and um, I encourage you just for a moment, just think, imagine if the whole church got a hold of that. I mean, so many in this place have, and if I could even broaden it out, not just New Hope, but the church in the world got a hold of that thought. Imagine the lights coming on for everyone, that this isn't just about me, this isn't just about what Jesus does in me, but this is what Jesus does through me. Not just what Jesus did to me, 
He touched me, he saved me, he's lifted me up, he's filled me with the Holy Spirit, he's given me purpose, given me a brand new page to write on. But it's not just about what he did to me. It's what he wants to do through me. What if people realize that the church isn't God's provision for me? But the church is God's provision for the world. It, it, you know, this flies in the face, I guess, of consumer mentality. That sort of attitude of, well, you know, the guy speaks and then we're up the back holding up cards. You know, 10, 8, 7, 5. Oh, well, the church down the road's doing something great. Let's go there. Is, is that the army? Is that the mentality that's going to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth? I, I don't think so. But people who are humble enough to recognize he's done something in me. All I am is a loaf of bread, but Lord, take like that little boy's lunch, I'll bring what I've got. I'll bring who I am, as imperfect as it is. Yeah. And if you'd take it in your hands, even if there's some breaking, even if there's some pain in the journey, if it means that you meet the needs of the world, yeah. then I've actually fulfilled my purpose. Imagine people getting a revelation that the church, the that we are his storehouse of mercy and grace, his God's storehouse of acts of kindness and service, a storehouse of healing and acceptance. Because I think that's the kind of people Jesus gives thanks for. I wonder if you'd stand with me today, and I sense today, even as I was preparing today, I sense that this would be like a holy moment. If you'd stand with me, I want to pray with us all today. And I pray as I've preached that, I pray you've just seen something and that you've seen yourself on the inside of the miracle. Don't, don't be looking at the miracle of the loaves and fishes like a great story that's full of awesome principles, but seeing yourself on the inside as the elements that Jesus took and worked a miracle with. That's you and that's me. And I, I just had a sense that this would be a, a holy moment for some of us, for hopefully for all of us. Maybe you have been allowing God and allowing God to distribute your life. Maybe today's brought some clarity to that. Maybe today's brought some joy to that, that, man, I never realised I never realized I was the kind of person Jesus is thankful for. I mean, I've been so busy being thankful for him. He's actually thankful for me. Maybe that's, that's a realization today, a revelation. Maybe, maybe you're at a point in your journey where you just think that's probably where I need to go next. If I'm going to keep growing with God, I've got to get to the point where I trust him enough to begin giving my life away. Whatever that looks like, however that looks, just... I've got, to, I've got to start letting God do something through me, not just to me. And so I want to pray for us today so if we could bow our heads. Father, I thank you. We, we stand in your presence today. And, and Lord, I thank you for encouraging so many that give so much of themselves. I thank you for encouraging them. I pray that revelation that Jesus is thankful, thankful towards yielded hearts, thankful towards those that would simply allow themselves in the Master's hand. And I pray, Father, that for all of us, Lord, whatever ways or means, however you need to take a hold of us, Lord, I pray that we would be sensitive and open and trusting of your mighty hand. We wouldn't be fearful. We wouldn't be concerned that that we're going to be damaged or we're going to become less, but we would trust you that when we're in your hand, we're in the best place that we could ever be. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name for the grace to open our hearts and to allow our lives to be part of the miracle, part of you feeding the earth, 
mercy and grace and love and kindness. We open our hearts to you, Jesus, as we do. If we could keep our heads bowed, our eyes closed just for another moment. You know, me, I guess, as a young man, I I came to an understanding, came to a, I guess we'd call it a revelation. It's an understanding that Jesus had laid his life down for me. That, That began this chain reaction of, of me pursuing him and eventually me laying down elements of my life. I've never regretted it. It's always brought life and light and increase whenever I put myself in the hand of God. And maybe you're here today and you haven't got to that point yet of really surrendering to Jesus. Maybe the trust issue has been a big thing. I, I really don't know whether I could really let my life go into the, into the hand of God. But friend, I want to encourage you that He only brings life. In this world, there's suffering no matter what you do. The difference is that when it's pressure that comes from pursuing Jesus, it always brings something good into your world. Always brings light and life and increase and freedom. And so in the final moments of this service, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus if that's what you believe you need to do. We're going to put a simple prayer up on the screen. It's a prayer of commitment and dedication dedication to Jesus and maybe you recognize in this place I've never done that maybe you recognize I've never been at this point in my life before I've never maybe realized that that Jesus was looking for me to surrender in a sense to to lay down my rights to self-rule and to actually allow him to be my savior and my lord but I want to give you the opportunity for that this morning in the closing moments of this service in a few moments' time, we're going to pray this prayer together. We'll all be praying it. But, but if you're here and, and you've never done something like this, you've never committed your heart to Christ, but you just know today God's touched your heart, you know you need to, then I want to give you the opportunity to be part of this. I'm going to ask you simply to raise your hand right where you are. Well, no one's looking around. But if that's you and you'd say, Pastor Chris, that's me. Awesome, mate. God bless you. Others in this place. And just know, Pastor Chris, you'd say to me, that's what I need. I need Jesus in my life more than anything else right now. I've never opened my heart to him, but I know I need him. That's awesome, mate. God bless you. Just one more moment. I don't want to rush on. I'm not going to labor it, but this is an incredibly important moment in people's journey. Incredibly important moment in your journey if you've never done it. As I look across one more time, there are others who have just joined these folk. Say yes to Jesus this morning. Fantastic. Awesome. Okay, you can look up at me again. And why don't we just congratulate people who've made that step of faith. And um, in a few minutes' time, we'll give you some next steps. But before we get to that, This is a simple prayer, and I just encourage you, make it your own, pray it authentically, and we'll all pray along with you. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for forgiving me. Come into my life, and I'll follow you. Amen. 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 That is absolutely awesome. Pastor Sue's going to let you know how you can really pursue that decision that you've made. Uh, But before she does, how about us this week? Who's feeling like a really fresh baked loaf of bread hey and who's excited actually about Jesus putting his hands on your life and actually beginning to do something there could be a little bit of pain and shaking in it but the end result is always that a miracle begins to happen and others are blessed and fed in Jesus name and as I've discovered you get blessed on the way remember the first thing that happened when you give yourself to Jesus he blessed that loaf. His blessing came upon it. So have a fantastic week. Awesome. Can we thank Chris?